Hi, good evening. Welcome to our U.S. Immigration Seminar. I am Diane Stewart, and I'm coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. And with me tonight is Bernard Wolfstorff of Wolfstorff Rosenthal. And Bernie's coming to us from Santa Monica in California, which is very close to Los Angeles. And we have Edward Strick, who is with um, Essential Document Solutions. And Edward is coming to us from Johannesburg at the tip of Africa in South Africa. So welcome, guys. And thank you so much for joining us all tonight. To, to all the people that have joined us, thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, we look forward to sharing with you as much information as we can. And at that point, I'd like to hand over to Bernie. Bernie, would you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Diane. It's really a pleasure. Um, I've had the privilege of working with you now for um, a year or two, uh, helping people immigrate to the United States. And um, what um, I think our audience is going to appreciate today is that the three of us each perform a different function. My job, uh, Bernie Wolfstorff, as the managing partner of Wolfstorff Rosenthal, we're a um, uh, immigration law firm handling global immigration. We have about 125 employees, six offices, and uh, decades of experience with immigration. The reason I like working with Diane Stewart from Pathway USA is that Diane helps people do everything except what we do, which is the legal stuff. So she will give you the big picture and help you Diane is going to fill in more detail in precisely what she does, but she provides vital service to people seeking to immigrate in helping them to get the big picture, schools, real estate, insurance, you name it. And Edward Strick, uh, I have a new working relationship with, and I must say uh, this is absolutely uh, critical because Edward is the document guy um, and helps many of our clients get documents um, and go through the maze of bureaucracy that is sometimes required. Edward, over to you to introduce yourself, sir. Good morning from a, a very early Johannesburg in South Africa, Bernard, and uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Diane. Um, I'm Edward Strick, the CEO of Essential Document Solutions. We are based in the heart of Santon, and our aim is to obtain the legal documents for immigration, South Africans immigration, immigrating at the moment, and also expats already residing anywhere on the planet. We can also assist several nationalities with other documents that they might need from the East and the West and all other countries in the North like Europe, etc. One thing I forgot to add with our previous webinar is that we can get you off the tax system of South Africa the moment you go over. So we can clear you off from that so you have no baggage left behind in South Africa. And that is a key element when you look at immigration where, you, where our partners at the moment look at documentation, taking people over, but we don't close the chapter. So we can bridge the gap to close the chapter as well. So passport renewals, unabridged documents, any qualifications that's gone missing during the years, we can obtain it all. And your unabridged documents for UCIS, we've got record timelines and we really invest so much time into it because our clients is on the end of the day, our families and we walk long, relationships with you guys even if you you move to the united states or whichever country you choose we can indeed renew your documents ongoing or surrender your citizenship or assist with the retention of your citizenship so there's many avenues of bypassing the embassies to cut the timelines where you guys wait so long from abroad for assistance over to you guys thank you Thanks, yeah. Edward. Um, that's, that's great. Um, yeah, certainly the, 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 the reason why we're doing this webinar, as Bernie alluded to earlier, is that we work well together. Um, at Pathway, we like to associate with people that can 
give us solutions, give us solve problems for our clients and deliver an, a, a level of serv service excellence that we expect. So I want to just chat briefly about Pathway at this point. Um, about 14 years ago, I was going through a very difficult US immigration personally, going, making a lot of mistakes, trusting the wrong people. And I decided that I would start this consultancy because people started to contact us and say, well, we're in a similar position. Please, can you help us? So I started this business and it, it has grown into something which, is, which I never really expected, but it has grown uh, you know, bigger than I, than I really expected. So what do we do? What we do is we give you a plan upfront while you are processing your applications with somebody like Bernie. He does all the legal um, applications. I'm not involved in that at all. Not, I don't want to be involved in it and I leave it all in Bernie's capable hands. But what I do do is I prepare your life before you get to the United States. Very difficult if you land in the United States and you don't know where to start. There are so many different things to living in the United States that foreigners do not understand. You think that if you have a, a little bit of English or you can communicate in English, that you've seen lots of movies made in Hollywood, which is very close to where Bernie is right now, but that is not good enough. You really need to understand how the country functions, what is expected of you, and ultimately, when you become a citizen, what, is, what your responsibilities are as a US citizen. So we are here for, to assist you and to plan your, roll out your, your plan every step of the way. Please um, follow us on Facebook. We're very active on Facebook. There's a lot of things going on in the world right now, like COVID and immigration changes. We post information up on our Facebook pages. Bernie does this as well. We're on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And so if you follow any of those, follow us and you get lots of valuable information on there. Next, I'd like to introduce Bernie again. Bernie, I'd like you to take us through the various ways that people can immigrate to the United States. Bernie's put together a PowerPoint presentation for us and he's going to take us through the various routes that you can take to get into the United States legally. Over to you, Bernie. Thank you, Diane. So we're going to run through options for people choosing to immigrate. Um, I'm going to break this down into two separate uh, sections. The first section dealing primarily with non-immigrant visas, temporary visas, that is. And the second section dealing with immigrant visas, or more commonly known as green cards. Um, what is a green card, people may say? A green card is the right to live and work in the United States for one's entire life. And after five years of green card status, you can apply to become an American citizen. And if your home country allows dual, then you can apply to be a dual citizen. Some countries have special procedures, such as South Africa, which requires permission before you become a US citizen. Otherwise, you lose your nationality. The other thing that I thought was very, very helpful, Edward, and I'm pleased to hear that you actually do this, is you help people emigrate from a tax perspective. And many, many people come to the United States with green cards. They don't realize that they have not terminated their tax obligation. So it is very helpful to understand that you take care of that when people come with a green card. So the first type of visa we're talking about is the non-immigrant visa. The non-immigrant visa, of course, many of you know the tourist visa, visitor's visa, that's a non-immigrant visa, the student visa, that's the F1 visa. People are very familiar with that as well. And then one moves on to the first most important work visa is the H-1B. Now, the H-1B is allocated on an annual basis in the month of March. They hold a lottery where the employer submits an application for $10. And if you are selected, then you are able to file the H-1B during the period April through to June. This is for well-qualified professionals with an employer and without a doubt is the best way for professionals who have job offers to immigrate to the United States. Of course, securing a job offer 
is not always easy, but if you have good technical skills and you have an employer ready to go to bat for you, the H-1B is the correct way to get started with your non-immigrant visa. Approved for initial period of three years, can be renewed for up to six years, during which time you can apply for a green card. The second way which people can immigrate to the United States is known as the company transfer visa. Now, there's a lot of misconception about the L1. I get calls literally every day, oh, I have a company with two employees. I read on the internet that I can open a company in the US. Well, you know, if every business worldwide could just open a company in the US, which quite frankly is very easy, um, you know, there probably would be about 3 billion additional people coming to the US. So the L1 visa tends to be somewhat restrictive if you are a small company. I generally say to people, if you have less than 50 employees in your overseas company, and you're gonna have less than 10 or 15 in the US, L1 may not be the best option for you. The visa category that I do like, and this is my favorite non-immigrant visa category, is based on treaties of commerce, navigation, some of the different treaties, NAFTA, North American Free Trade, it has a new name, but under the E1 and E2, E1 is for substantial trade with the US, where more than 50% of the trade is between your home country and the United States. There are over 80 countries that have the E2 treaty. And if one makes a substantial investment, usually defined as about $150,000, one can ordinarily obtain an E2 visa. Um, South Africa does not have this treaty, but Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Korea, um, Australia, um, so many countries have the treaty, but some simply don't. So if you don't have a treaty passport, one of the things you can do is acquire the nationality or second passport. Two of the popular programs at the moment are the Grenada program, where you can acquire a Grenadian passport, or secondly, a Turkish passport. The Turkish passport requires an investment of approximately $250,000. The uh, Grenada passport is somewhat cheaper. So then you can acquire an E2 nationality um, and thereafter make an investment in a business. Of course, that becomes two steps and some people would prefer to just go with a one step. So I've mentioned three visa categories, the H, the L, the E. The H is for well-qualified professionals, the L is for company transfers, the E is for investors and the final category that I will mention today is the O visa for people of extraordinary ability. Now, I get a lot of people who say to me, Bernie, I'm clearly one of the O1s. I went on the internet. I was the best in my class. I was the top of my high school. I got the math prize in, uh, in high school. You know, folks, that's not quite it. Uh, what we're looking at is somebody who is of national or international renown. So this is a very high standard. You really have to be amongst the top of your field. And I always want to see press. If you're so famous, I want to Google you and I want to find out that there are lots of articles written about you. Now, in addition to these categories, the H, the L, the E, the O, there are numerous other categories. There's the P visa for performing arts. There's the R visa for religious workers. There's the I visa for journalists. There's a J visa for exchange visitors. There's H2 visa for temporary workers, H3 trainee visa. So there's an entire range of non-immigrant visas, one of which may well fit your circumstances. So just giving us a little plug, if you wanna get started, uh, please reach out to Diane or myself or Edward in his case, depending on what assistance you directly need, and we'd be happy to get you started in the right direction. Now, let's move on to immigrant visas or green cards. There are four basic ways to get a green card. The first and possibly most popular or well-known is the DV lottery. Now, the DV lottery is, handled, is held once a year, normally in the month of October or November. 
Results normally come out in May or June, a little bit late this year. But the US government gives away 50,000 green cards on this lottery. Now, you will see a lot of advertising for the lottery. If at the end of applying for the lottery, they ask you for money, you're probably on the wrong website. There's the address of the lottery, www.travel.state.gov, three dots or periods, if you come from an English country, www, period, travel, period, state, period, gov. One of the little quirks about America where they call that a period, but it's not the at sign. So for those of you who want to apply for the lottery, good luck. They will send out almost 100,000 winners, of which 50,000 will be eligible to obtain green cards. I will give myself a plug and say, if you want to apply for a green card and you are selected, you may want to retain a lawyer because getting the documents, for example, what Edward does, can take months and months. And if you leave it to the last minute, well, tough luck. You won the lottery. You didn't get to cash that ticket. So let's move on from the lottery because you certainly don't need a lawyer for that. And let's talk about family immigration. At the present time, approximately 70% of green cards are issued based on family. Now, some of the family immigration can be a little bit complicated. But if you are not the spouse, parent, or minor child of a US citizen, you're going to be stuck in a waiting line. The immediate relative category, spouse, parent, or minor child of a US citizen, relatively quick, takes about two months or so, and you can get a green card. Easy as that. Well, of course, nothing is as easy as that. There's a lot of additional challenges, public charge provisions, showing that you won't become a burden on the state. But to summarize in regard to family immigration, the key element is to make sure that you fall under the immediate relative category, or the other alternative category is the spouse or child of a legal permanent resident, categorized as F2A, the second listing there. All the other categories have terribly long lines, 10-year waiting line. If you have a sibling, a brother or sister who's a US citizen, forget about it. It's 12 to 15 years. Um, it's going to take a long time. You can file. Go ahead and file if you want, but generally that's not something you're going to need a lawyer for because 12, 15 years, you can file the application yourself. But the second preference category as the spouse or minor child of a permanent resident is a good green card category. Now, let's move over to the employment-based immigrant visa categories. The first three categories that we have are the alien of extraordinary ability, the EB1A, now, I had previously mentioned the O-1 visa. The O-1 visa is a temporary work visa approvable for up to three years and renewable in one-year increments, but it can, in many instances, be converted to the EB-1 if you are truly extraordinary. Now, I mentioned the O-1 is for top people. The EB-1A is for the top of the top. So even though you're O-1, that doesn't assure success. The second category, which we like, but this is an employment-based category. The nice thing about the EB-1 is you can self-sponsor. You are living in Hong Kong or China, and you happen to be an extraordinary individual who can show that you'll benefit the United States. You can self-sponsor. But the EB-1B, where you are outstanding researcher with at least three years of experience, does require sponsorship, either through a university or research department. And then finally, you have the multinational executive, the EB1C. Let's call this the mother of the L1. You came in on a company transfer. Your company transfer L1A has been approved, and now you can convert it to a green card. Again, a slightly higher standard, but nevertheless, so of these three categories, the EB1A is the mother of O1, and the EB1C is the mother of the L1 allowing you to convert it to a green card. The second preference category is for people with master's degree or bachelor's plus five. 
And if you are an individual whose particular skill would greatly benefit the United States, make a substantial impact in your field, again, you can't just be good. You really have to be dynamic. And the field has to be one which is of major interest. So if you are an architect specializing in green energy projects and you've developed some new methodology and we've got press about you and your accomplishments in that area, let's talk about a national interest waiver. You might well be successful if you have a master's degree or bachelor's plus five and active in a specific area, which is a benefit to the US. The employment-based third preference category, commonly known as the PERM application, this is the way most people get their green cards. This is where you're on an H-1B. So this is the H-1B and the EB-2, EB-3 goes together where the job has to be advertised and we prove that there are no qualified Americans who can do that job. At the moment, we have had enormous success with these applications. Of course, with high unemployment resulting from COVID, we may see a change in the EB3 attitude. Let's move on now to the EB5 category. The EB4 category, by the way, is for religious workers. So if you are either ordained or in a religious occupation, such as religious instructor, religious teacher, or religious vocation, such as a nun, monk, you might be eligible for an EB4 green card, and let's call that the mother of the R1 religious worker visa. Now on to the EB5. Why do I spend so much time with the EB5? Well, look, let's be real. The nice thing about the EB5 is if you have the money, and if you have the ability to invest, now the amount was 500,000 until November 21, where it went up to 900,000 as the minimum investment. But the bottom line is that if you make an investment through a regional center in a project and you do your due diligence, and I know Diane's very active in this field, has lots of experience meeting with EB5, lots of experience working with different people in the field. And uh, Diane will talk a little bit about EB5 as well, but she has the bottom line. If you're able to make the $900,000 investment, current processing time anywhere from about a year to a year and a half, two years, it's quite frankly being close to two years, but we hope it's gonna go down to one and a half soon you might be eligible to apply for an EB-5, make a substantial investment and get your green card. After five years of permanent residence, you should be eligible to apply for US citizenship. So in a nutshell, this is the key element of the EB-5 program. The first step is doing the source of funds. The second step, is to choose a project which creates the appropriate number of jobs and then you're in a position where you can apply for an EB-5 green card. So summarizing again, non-immigrant visa, the H-1B, the work visa, the L visa, the company transfer, the O visa for extraordinary ability people, the E visa for investment, moving into the green card, we have family immigration, citizen or permanent resident spouse is what works quickly, all the other family categories are slow. The lottery is open to everybody. First preference is for the extraordinary. Second preference for the very well qualified. Third preference for the skilled worker. Fourth preference for the religious worker. And fifth preference for the high net worth investor. And the United States admitted close to a million immigrants last year. There's gonna be a lot less this year. But that in a nutshell, is the US immigration option. And if you have any questions or more detail, please feel free to email me, Bernard at wolfstorff.com and back to you, Diane Stewart. There's Diane's email, info at pathwayusa.co.za. And Edward is available at ceo at essentialdocumentsolutions.co.za. So on that cherry note, Back to you, Diane. Do we have any questions for today? 
Yes, we do, Bernie. We have lots of exciting questions. Um, thank you so much for taking us through the, um, all the various legal options of getting into the United States. Um, we have a question here from Andres. What's the difference between a visa, a green card, and citizenship? Very good. So the visa is a stamp in your passport that allows you to get on a plane, come to the United States, at least present yourself at the border, and then depending on what category it is, you could be allowed to visit, study, or work. So the visas, or invest. So the visas are usually with a specific category, it's a generic term. What is a green card? Well, the green card is the big one. That's the, the major prize. And that is the right to live and work in the United States for your whole life. And then US citizenship, which can either be by birth or acquisition, is the highest level. So obviously, I encourage everybody to try to move to US citizenship if they can. But it takes time. And normally, you start off at the non-immigrant visa, up, up to the green card, and off to citizenship. I would consider it Think of elementary school, high school, and then university. Three separate stages, as is uh, similar in education. Thank you, Bernie. Um, the next question we have is from Shyamalan, who says he's wanting to investigate immigration into the US, but cannot find reliable sources of information. Well, yeah. you've come to the right spot. But there he says, where can I learn about all of the visa options? Well, we've just taken you through those. I hope that answers your question as best you can, but you can further uh, get more information from Bernie, um, as well as information about building a credit score, schooling for my children, buying a home in the US, what to bring, what to leave behind. Uh, basically, I'm looking for somebody to help me with all the aspects. Can you help? And of course, the answer is yes. And that is, in fact, the reason why we've done these, this, uh, these webinars this week is because we want to do just that. We want to give you all the, the most important pieces to enable you to make this move. Bernie, your comment? Well, Diane, um, that's a, the perfect question because that's why the three of us uh, who are separate companies, uh, we do not uh, work for each other. We are completely separate. But Diane is the very often what I would call the starting point because she can help advise you. America, in some respects, is like 50 different countries. There is no similarity when you go to Hawaii, um, tropical, beautiful Hawaii uh, is very different from New York, which is very different from LA. Um, and um, Diane can help advise you on what might be a perfect fit, uh, what type of business uh, you might be interested in, help you with locating real estate, property, education, of course, which is a big driver for a lot of people coming over. So Diane is the, what I call relocation specialist who handles pretty much everything. And um, we only handle the visa side and Edward handles what I've discovered, uh, not only help you with documents, but also can help you uh, with um, uh, obtaining passport renewals. Something I learned from you, Edward, that if you're living abroad, you have to apply for your passport renewal within 12 months of expiration. Now, I didn't know that. So I'm still learning uh, almost every day, but by working as a team, we can provide the cumulative benefit and knowledge of all three of us. So um, back to you, Diane. Any questions, more questions today? Yes, we do. Well, one of my clients called me the Google of immigration yesterday, which was a huge compliment. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know everything, but what I did say is that be very careful of Googling because 80% of the information might be correct, but 20% is not shown. So be very careful before you just believe everything on Google. Always consult professionals that have a track record. And uh, well, all of us here on this webinar do have track records that you can check us out and we'd like you to do that. And you get a lot of information from the internet. And the problem that I find, particularly with immigration, I've done a very short summary, but the truth is that um, US immigration is very complicated and uh, you really can't afford to make mistakes. Uh, you were talking about references. You know, I got just yesterday, um, of course the office is closed, but they scanned and sent me 
a copy of a thank you letter, which was just quite wonderful um, to get those letters where the client indicated that um, from the day they had met us and they had met with several other lawyers and how we changed their life. There were three sisters and they were in the US and they wanted to bring over the fourth sister. So finally they were all reunited. Um, the hardest part of immigration in many respects is family reunification. So being able to pull your whole family together is something that uh, we focus on. How do we bring not only you, but uh, the entire family so that we can live together um, uh, in an environment that we're comfortable with. Diane, more questions? Yes, I just want to comment on that, Bernie. Um, few people know that if they come to the United States on, for example, an EB-5, they come with a green card. So they arrive with that green card and five years after that, they are eligible for citizenship. And that enables them to petition their parents um, to come over almost, you know, within 12 months of the petition. So that is something very important when, when considering what pathway to take to get into the United States. I always call the EB-5 program the, the Rolls Royce of all visas. It's smooth, it's clean. And if you work with wonderful providers that I, um, wonderful projects and companies that manage projects as we do, um, you have a pretty, almost a guarantee. I don't like to use that word, but it's pretty much plain sailing. And it gives me great joy to see clients that have, that have gone that route and are successfully here and happy here. Um, well, Valentina Diane, you, asks- you, Oh, sorry, I, I was just interrupting, yeah. but you, you touched on the concept of due diligence in the EB-5 area. And, um, you know, I like to emphasize, you've got to do due diligence, do considerable research, study the projects, listen to what people tell you, but also review the documents carefully yourself because investing always requires uh, caution, in-depth analysis, know what you're doing. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize that on the EB-5. Uh, we love to claim that we have very high success rates, but it's because our clients are so diligent and we do hear stories which quite frankly, sometimes make me cringe. Uh, but back to you, Diane, you had another question. Yes, very much so. You know, be very careful what you find on, um, on, on the internet. Um, there are very, very few companies that I would really trust in this business, in the EB-5 arena, so be very careful about that. Um, next question, can non-residents buy, from, from Peter, can non-residents buy property in the US before they actually immigrate? Um, I'm gonna answer that if I may. Um, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, many of our clients, we recommend that they do that because if they purchase a property before they get here, um, they can start their, their credit score accumulating and, um, in the meantime. So what they do is they, we find we have a mortgage program that we can offer them using their foreign uh, credit score or their foreign credit history. And we then, um, they, you know, they come over on a visitor's visa and they purchase the property and then they go home. We then arrange for them to have a tenant in that property. The tenant then pays their full mortgage and what we call PITI, which is principal interest taxes and insurance. And when they're ready to come, they give the tenant notice to vacate the property. And now they have a property to move into. Once they get here on their green card or their visa, they should get a social security number. Once they get the social security number, they can then take it down to the bank and the bank will then key it into their account. Voila, instantly they will have a credit score after one or two months. So that's how, that's just one of the things that we teach our clients how to do when we hold their hands so that when they get here, they have a much easier way of doing things because your credit score is incredibly important when you get to America. Without a credit score, you can't even get a cell phone. Um, and, and that's like, absolutely correct. I mean, it's the, understanding all these little nuances about um, obtaining credit, having credit scores, having good credit scores uh, are so important to living in the United States. Uh, that's not stuff that we do, but uh, at Pathways USA, Diana is very experienced in that area. And I must say, investing in real estate in the United States, um, sure, you have real estate cycles every 10 or 15 years, but um, the reality is that probably the best way to make money in America, quite frankly, is to invest in real estate. Uh, real estate values seem to go up and um, I'm certainly not an expert 
in investing, but um, the better the real estate, the more it seems to go up over time. And uh, the US government is very, very generous. You do not need to have legal status. In fact, you could be undocumented and own real estate. So that is, uh, US real estate is probably one of the best assets to buy, uh, certainly not my business, but uh, you can start off with, uh, by speaking to people like Diane. So Diane, any other last questions for today? Yes. Um... Where do I start? Who do I contact if, I want, if I've decided that I want to emigrate to the United States? This is a question from Natalie. She says, who do I contact? What do I do? Do I speak to an immigration attorney or do I come to Pathway? What do I do and why? Good question. Well, Ready? I'm, I'm going to go with, if you have a job offer from a US company, then you might want to start with uh, an immigration lawyer. If you do not have a job offer, then I would honestly suggest that you may want to start with a company like Pathway because all I'm going to do is say, you know, you need to go and get a job offer or make an investment. So if your immigration strategy is clear, you've already married an American citizen, well, then you could come to me. But the truth is you always need a person like Diane. You always need a person like Edward who can help you with documents. Um, with regard to retaining an attorney, the decision of when to retain an attorney is normally when you're about to do the legal work because, um, and I don't want to sound rude, but lawyers are usually fairly busy and, um, you know, we have something, I hate charging billable hours, uh, so we try to do fixed fees, but either way, people don't like paying legal fees, people don't like paying consultation fees, so generally speaking, you're going to want to start with Diane. Bernie, I've got two more questions that I want to get to quickly. Um, the first, uh, the last, uh, the second last one is how soon do I need to renew my passport uh, if I live out of far away from the country that my passport is from? So if I live in America and I've got a South African passport, how soon must I uh, renew it? Edward, could you answer that? Absolutely, Diane. Thank you. Um, for each and every South African living abroad that we call expats or suffers far from home, you have to reapply for your renewal 12 months prior to expiry date. And that relates back to Act 1994. So the majority of people, unfortunately, do not check their documents. We recommend that you check your passport, your visas, all those kind of stuff that's related that controls your whole life should be checked every six months, whether you've got children, whether you've got a wife, to ensure that you stay and remain in these brackets. And that will give you so many, um, so much comfort or ease to know that your stuff is in good hands instead of jumping up and down, realize I've got a flight in, ne in the next three weeks and my passport had less than six months on it. Very helpful, yeah. Edward. Um, Edward, um, you know, I learned so much uh, from you because this is what you do every day. I wanted to ask you one other question. South Africa introduced a requirement that if a parent is traveling, um, a single parent is traveling with a young child, they need a notarized permission from the other spouse. Is that requirement still in place? Because I know it created massive disruption. And are you able to help with those type of things? Uh, Bernie, absolutely. We can assist with that. Uh, it's called the parental consent form. We can email the document off to wherever the other spouse is or the father live at the moment. And it has to be stamped by a mission. There's so no, that would be one of the South African missions has to formally accept this document. They can't just use a notarized version. Um, no, there's no notarized uh, done on the document. It just needs to be um, endorsed or how we normally say certified by the mission abroad. And it can be DHL to South Africa. Got it. Very helpful because I know a lot of people traveling. And Diane, I think we're on to our last question for today. Yes, last question is from Richard. I have a child who is exceptional in their field. 
can I get into the US? Can he get into the US this way? He is a um, he's a ballet dancer, and my daughter is a Springbok show jumper. Uh, how do where do we start? So this is quite common. We have a lot of very accomplished young people. Um, the issue here, of course, is how accomplished are you? Um, I, I love the fact that I did a case once um, for a young lady. Um, she was 10 years old. Uh, if you had Googled the most beautiful child in the world, uh, you would have got her. And I managed to get her an extraordinary ability visa. And of course, I managed to get the parent, the essential support visa. But that was one of the youngest that I've ever done as a principal, which is a 10 year old bringing in the, her family, in this case, her mother um, uh, on a visa. Um, generally speaking with younger people, it can be more difficult. Um, if you're at a Springbok level, if you're representing your country um, in sports, um, that's still not enough. You still have to have a manager or agent uh, and you have to have um, uh, be participating in an established league um, uh, in, of show jumping. So um, this particular person uh, would uh, potentially be able to get a P visa, that's the P1S visa, P1A visa as a sports person participating um, and as a ballet dancer, again, depending how accomplished, quite directly, a 13-year-old ballet dancer is probably not going to be the principal. We actually do all the immigration work for the LA Ballet, um, and um, you know maybe they'll take you on for the Christmas show. Um, but realistically speaking, um, it's quite difficult to bring in young people as a principal applicant. The general rule is that the primary applicant can bring in all children under the age of 21, and you need to have considerable accomplishments. So on that cheery note, what I do suggest is if you've got a question, please feel free to reach out to myself, Bernard at Wolfstorff.com, to Diane at info at pathwaysusa.co.za, and to Edward Strick at CEO Essential Document Solutions.co.za. And on that cheery note, thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. And Diane, Edward, any last comments? Um, yeah, I'd like to thank everybody. Sorry, Edward. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this evening. Thank you to Bernie and to Edward. Um, I'm going to give him a chance to say goodbye. Um, we are open and, and available to help you at any time in any situation. So please email us, as Bernie said. We look forward to being of service to you. Edward? Uh, just a last point uh, before we end this webinar. Uh, the last two days we received quite a number of expats who said well look we can't obtain a south african passport at the moment due to lockdown in south africa which might only become available at level one we're not sure no one ain't saying anything we, we we just go with the flow at the moment and the majority of them said well look i'll fly out with my british or i'll fly out with my u.s passport it's illegal you cannot enter South Africa with it, and you cannot exit South Africa with it unless you surrendered your citizenship. You are welcome to try your luck or push your luck, but your faith will be your faith. And then thank you so much for joining you guys now from Johannesburg so early in the morning. And I hope you enjoy the afternoon in the US. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And until next time, we uh, look forward to speaking with you and helping you if we can. Thank you. And bye-bye from wonderful Los Angeles. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.